Welcome to Healthcare Experience Matters. This podcast is brought to you by the Healthcare Experience Foundation and is dedicated to transforming the healthcare experience so that every person can receive and deliver the best care. We invite you to learn more by visiting healthcareexperience.org. Today, our guest is Kathleen Lynham. Kathleen is an executive coach and senior advisor here at the Healthcare Experience Foundation. Kathleen, welcome to the program. And first, before we jump into things, I just want you to tell us a little bit about your professional background, and then we're going to jump into a discussion on empathy and communication. Sure. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me, Casey. It's good to be here. So I am a nurse, um, a registered nurse this past year. I just celebrated my 46th year as a nurse. It's kind of hard to believe. I've been in hospital operations about 35 years, starting as a staff nurse, then a nurse manager, director. Eventually, I became a chief nurse officer, and I did that for about seven, eight years And since then, I retired and I've been working as an executive coach around the country, which has been a fabulous opportunity to, first of all, see rural hospitals to large academic centers like Duke and Barnes Jewish. And so I've been able to work with staff nurses, with housekeepers, with executive team. And in the last five years, I've really been blessed to be doing a lot of physician coaching and physician leadership development. So this is a wonderful culmination and a topic I'm very excited about. Yeah. And I'll just add that Kathleen is what we affectionately refer to as a Jersey girl. She answered her calling to care and became a registered nurse at the Valley Hospital in Ridgewood, New Jersey, where she had an 18-year journey from staff nurse to vice president of acute and ambulatory services. And, you know, this is also, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Kathleen, where you found your passion for coaching and, and helping healthcare teams. Is that right? You are right. And I am a Jersey girl. I didn't want to I don't want to, you know, turn anybody off right away. But yes, I'm a very proud Jersey girl. And Valley Hospital is very good to me. I had a wonderful growing up experience there, um, 18, almost 20 years there. And coaching, I believe, is every leader's job. Anyone who has a direct report or works with other people in any team, coaching is something that I began early on and have loved it my entire career. So let's talk empathy. How would you best describe empathy as it pertains to the patient experience? Well, I think the simple definition of empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And in the patient experience, it's often the tipping point. We know from experience that something that's very important to patients is that when they feel cared for and listened to. And in order to demonstrate that a nurse, a doctor, or a housekeeper, anyone cares about another person is to show that with words or demonstrate demonstrate it with actions that you understand what someone is feeling. And then somehow, not only do you understand and communicate that, you have to acknowledge it. So with a comforting touch of a hand on the shoulder or an encouraging smile, or just saying the words, "Mm, you you know, you look worried or you look concerned, that's really bringing empathy to life. And and that's what communicates that I care for someone. Can you discuss the importance of not only building trust with patients, but also please talk about building the trust of the patient's family members? Ah, yeah. So if I say empathy is the foundation of a good patient experience, the next most important step like in any relationship, is building trust. And you're so right. We have an important responsibility in not only building trust of the patient, but of the family, however that's defined by the patient. Trust can never be assumed, especially in healthcare, now more than ever. So we must work mindfully at building the confidence, in other words, the trust of a patient and their family. For instance, confidence that they made the right choice in coming to the emergency department or that we're gonna take great care of them, or that their surgeon or physician is the best in the specialty. You know, one way we can show support of everyone on the team is by purposely, we call it managing up the others who will care for them. Like thinking about when we're handing off from an emergency room to the ICU or to radiology, 
the process of acknowledging a strength or a talent of that next person in line is a great way to build trust and be a good teammate along the way. And that managing up and that building confidence builds the trust of the patient and their family. Because we know that when people go home, it's the family members that take care of them and support them, or at least uh, acknowledge that. And um, that's why building them as a unit is important for all of us to do. Sharing the feelings of another person and, and trying to understand their feelings, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is at the heart of practicing empathy. So how can someone do this better? Oh, yes, you're very, you're very right. That's true. And we do know from years of research that babies as young as six to nine months old, they demonstrate empathy. If you've ever seen the video of one baby crying and another little baby sort of can't even walk, but reaching over to comfort and touch that person. So really empathy is within each of us. But if we've not had someone treat us with empathy, or we've lived in a way that required perhaps minimum human interaction in our jobs, we may have forgotten. And my, I'm a frequent educator in the emotional intelligence process for leadership. And it's been remarkable to watch the ahas on people's faces when we begin to teach the basic skills of self-awareness and self-regulation, which you need in order to understand social awareness or how to demonstrate empathy. So the first step, going back to your question, is how do we teach it is, is first of all, to desire to improve. The second step is being mindful. And that mindfulness begins with learning how to be present to one another. It sounds simple, but in today's complex, chaotic world in healthcare, it really takes an effort to remove distractions, choosing to focus on another's face, on their body language, on their words, and listening to not only what is said, but what is not said. Um, And then reflect that back in a caring manner. For example, if I'm a nurse giving a med to someone and and perhaps I notice that uh, their face looks confused, I could say something like, you know, I was just reviewing your medication side effects with you. You looked a little confused or concerned. Tell me, what were you thinking? I want to make sure I'm doing a good job helping you understand what to look for. Now, if you remember that empathy is identifying what others are feeling and acknowledging it, now I don't know if that patient's confused or scared, but by saying, tell me what you're thinking, I'm giving them an opportunity to share and making it safe for them to share so they can tell me I didn't understand or I'm frightened. And again, not only am I connecting with this patient, but I'm building that trust, I'm building that confidence, and I'm being empathic at the same time. That's great stuff as always. And how does building trust through proper communication better engage patients in their own care? Oh yeah, engaging patients is so important. You know, if empathy is the foundation and trust I believe is the cornerstone of any any relationship, um, and certainly in the patient experience, And, you know, it's fascinating to me. I told you earlier, I've been in nursing 45 years and what kind of was intuitive to me way back when has been proved by the neuroscience of trust. And the the research has shown that only when someone trusts another, that in our brains, that defense mechanism, which makes us either flight or fight, but if they feel trusting and safe, then the brain relaxes and it's only then that they can hear. And my famous little saying is, if there's fear, they cannot hear. And so if I'm not afraid, then I can listen and understand. And honestly, years ago, I think back, it was so hard to fathom that something I or someone else painstakingly taught or explained to a patient and found out that it went in one ear and out the other. And we realize now that perhaps I didn't take the time to be present to that patient and reduce their fear, take time to find out what was wrong and build that trust and also understand their health literacy. So now we know about practicing good teach back methods and not only teach what we're doing, but why we're doing something will improve compliance. When patients understand the what, that helps a whole lot. But when they understand the why we're doing it, it increases understanding and their ability to say, oh, that makes sense, and I'm going to do that. So it boils down to 
if someone trusts me, hopefully they're going to feel safe enough to say, could you say that again? Or I don't really understand. And that allows us that great opportunity to move forward and ensure more compliance and more understanding as they're they leave our organization and perhaps go home. Now I want to ask about nonverbal communication. What are some of the nonverbal communication tactics that may help in building some of that trust? Oh, good question. I think back in the early years, we were taught not to show our expression. We didn't want to frighten patients. So we were really not taught to be warm and caring in the ways and we're going back 40 years. And now we know how long that is. And so being present in body, mind, and spirit and practicing this mindfulness when you're entering a room is so important. You know, I, I would love to spend some time talking with you that in another, at another uh, episode of this, but, you know, there's certain little things that we do over and over in healthcare. And if we're mindful and take those rituals and begin to use them to be present to someone, that will help. I think the first thing that I, I think is important is to be aware of our own listening face. Now, for me, I know I learned early on when I'm serious and listening to someone, I furrow my eyebrows and I, I'm looking intently at them. Well, in fact, that could be a very intimidating face to other people. And so the first thing we think about is look at your listening face, look at your teaching face and be mindful of that. Am I Am I giving the patient and their family the message it's okay to ask me questions? So smiling is a, is a great way to ease all, um, all anxiety and tension. Also, we always encourage relating to a person and a patient and the family um, as a person, not just their diagnosis. So finding that personal connection is a wonderful way to build and practice that. Uh, and the other thing is to also think about asking questions, you know, tell me more about what you're thinking and tell me more about what you're feeling. Those are really important ways to, I, it's verbal, it's not necessarily verbal, but it's all about giving permission to patients to ask us more questions and tell us how they're feeling. Two-part question for you. I'm going to first ask, is building empathy kind of like any other muscle in in the body where you have to work at it to get it better? And if so, what are some ways we can better build that quote unquote empathy muscle? Yes. And I know you as a runner and a, and a exercise guy and me as my daily walking. Yes. Like any muscle, uh, the way you want to strengthen it is building it through practice. And so Practicing empathy at, you know, practicing at home, we encourage, we do a lot of leadership development. People are on all the time at work and you're present to this one and present to that one. And sometimes the people who don't get our empathic uh, personality and persona are those that we love the most who are at home. So when you're walking in the house and being present to your, your spouse, your partner, your children is a good way to, the first thing and first and foremost is to be aware of how much you talk and perhaps begin listening more than speaking, letting others go first. Practice watching others and trying to figure out what they're doing. As nurses, we do this all the time clinically. If you're in a ballpark and looking around to make sure who's going to have, who might be having a heart attack and who might be a smoker or who might be whatever. The same thing with trying to understand what people are feeling, experiencing. In fact, that's one of the first ways they began to build emotional intelligence. I think um, Goldman, when they did the studies, they put a movie up without the, without the words, and they asked people to figure out what was going on in, a, in the movie. And when they were able to articulate, uh, the people that were able to articulate, they're angry in that scene, and they were concerned, and they were fighting, um, they realized that they have a higher um, level of social awareness. And so that's the same thing. Begin to start looking at people and, and observing their face and observing their tone and their and the rapid pace or the slow pace that they have. Um, finding questions that invite people to share what they're feeling. That's really important before leaving a room. You know, tell me what you're thinking about. Tell me what worries you. Uh, in, in hospitals and, and in healthcare organizations and clinics, Getting into that practice is saying, 
tell me what worries you so that I can reassure you and make you feel comfortable and confident. Those are all some of the practices we can each do every day to build our own empathy. And as a podcast host, I understand the importance and the power of open-ended questions. Uh, I want yeah, I want you to tell me about the power of open-ended questions when it comes to empathy and if you have any more advice on on you know coming up with those questions. You know, you're absolutely right. We always feel better when we get our patients to answer our questions yes and no and we feel we can check it off the checklist. And that's been something sort of task oriented that we've done in healthcare. You're absolutely right. When we give somebody the opportunity to answer an open uh, ended question, we give them permission and we give them the safe area to answer freely and honestly, which will allow us insight to more about what's worrying people, what's bothering people, what's concerning people. And so, including all of that that idea of open-ended questions is a wonderful way to invite people to share. And that's, that's really critical for all of us in healthcare. So if we want to exceed a patient experience, a patient's expectations, we need to have an understanding where they are so that we can provide them with basically the best quality, the best safety, the best outcomes. I think the most important thing that people can do is take time to do some self-assessments and reflect. All of us in healthcare, we're so busy jumping from one, one patient to another, from one situation to another. One of the best practices that we can do each and every day, whether it's on the way home from work or before we go to sleep at night, is reflect. So what went well today? What did I feel good about? You know, what patient shared with me something that I didn't expect? You know, what's one thing I, I, that didn't go so well? What did I learn about that? And what can I do differently? And then finally, what am I grateful for? I think when we take the time to be reflective in our daily lives, it only makes us healthier, but I think it makes us happier in the long run. And then we can grow from that and share that with our patients and their families. Earlier in this discussion, you mentioned removing distractions to better practice mindfulness. This seems big. There's a lot of distractions in this day and age. And most notably, I'm thinking of interruptions such as email alerts, smartphone notifications, etc. Do you have any more advice on how we can better practice mindfulness through removing these distractions or at least mitigating some of them? It's a challenge in, in the healthcare world. It is. We do, you do have vibrate on our, on our phones. And so the ability to think before I speak and before I enter a patient's room and, and prioritize what's the most important. If I'm teaching, I don't want distractions. So putting my, my beeper on vibrate and going in and setting the expectation for the patients. I want, this is an important part of our care right now. So I'm going to sit down. You and I are going to have a conversation and making sure that we reduce those distractions by closing the door, turning off our phones. That's really helpful. Asking someone else to cover our lights while we're in the room. I'm thinking about the bedside nurses purposely. And even physicians, we talk about this all the time. How do you remove distractions? A, you the only time you look at your phone, you say, excuse me, one second, I am on call for ICU. So if that's a life safety thing, you have to look at your room, your phone, but you can, um, you know, ask others to cover you. And it's not a perfect world. And our patients will forgive uh, anything as long as they understand that we care about them. And we've sort of built that trust and confidence that we started off with in the first place. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, that is, that is very good. That giving us a lot to think about that I know personally, I I didn't have in mind when we were initially talking about having this discussion. I'm, I'm familiar with your body of work and you, you mentioned it earlier. Emotional intelligence for leadership is really one of your subjects of expertise. Is there anything more you want to tell us about how emotional intelligence factors into today's discussion? I I think there's two things that um, 
matter the most, and it ties to my mindfulness that I, I kind of reference. In order to be empathic, in order to connect with patients, with team members, with families, that requires the social awareness. That requires the ability to scan a room, to get the feel for a room, to understand where people are and connect with them. The thing I think is most important, if you don't have self-awareness, you're never going to get social awareness. So it's one of those in the old days, Campbell's soup, you know, one without the other, soup and sandwich. You can't have one without the other. You need self-awareness and then that self-management, you need to control those sort of responses to people that we may not like or push our buttons before you can grow and have this social awareness. The ultimate goal of mastering emotional intelligence is this relationship management bucket. And in leadership, you need it to be successful. As a physician, to build trust and confidence of your patient and family, you need it. As a nurse, as a caregiver, as a physical therapist, as a social worker, we need that because we need the trust and empathy. So my suggestions is tune into some of our podcasts, take some classes, and begin to determine and understand best how, how self-aware am I? Um, surprisingly, when it comes to um, research, many people, we don't even know the emotions we're experiencing. And so there's lots of work to be done. And it's a, it is, it's a wonderful topic. So I encourage people to find out more, certainly look at all of resources we offer of it. Maybe you'll have me back one day to talk more about it. Absolutely. And it feels like some of this emotional intelligence and empathy, it comes more natural to some people than others. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is, is it something that just some people have to work harder to, to, to get good at or improve upon? Um, what do you think about that? Oh, yeah. Some people are, are born empaths that they just are more attuned and more sensitive to, um, to others. It's not a matter, remember, it's not a matter of intelligence. You know, people who have high IQ, um, it, it, it certainly can make you successful in certain jobs, but we know the key for successful leadership roles and and I consider anyone in healthcare in any kind of leadership role so important. You have to have that strong EQ also. So you're right. I think of nieces and young kids that are empaths very early on and and it's probably nourished from early on. Those of us that are empathic to begin with are it's a nourished thing. It's something we're rewarded and feel good about. So we continue to grow in those areas. For others they followed a path um, that has led them down a different way where it's more about um, disciplining their intelligence and, and learning that stuff and never taking the time to sort of look around and be present to others. So you're right. For some people, it comes naturally, still needs to be you know, honed, if you will, because relationship management is sort of the, you know, the quintessential where we all want to be. And that takes time. And back to that first part, mindfulness and purpose. Today's discussion has just been so dense with incredible information, the research of trust. If there's fear, they cannot hear, I believe was one of the quotes. There was many other great ones in there talking about body language and that listening face. There's just so much to unpack from today's discussion and definitely one that I would probably encourage people to go back and to listen to twice. There's really that much, I feel like, great information in today's today's episode. And of course, we are obviously going to have more episodes with Kathleen Lynham, who's been our guest today on Healthcare Experience Matters, talking empathy and communication and emotional intelligence, mindfulness, so much great stuff. Before we wrap up, I'll just ask if you have anything else to add to today's discussion that you think might benefit the listeners. Well, no, I thank you so much, Casey. It's been a privilege. And I think you have very good empathic ways yourself and um, keep up your good work. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Just it starts, I guess, with with great listening. I just try to hang on to every word um, that you were saying today and and ask some questions uh, accordingly. So you did that well. Good reflection. Good job. Thank you, Kathleen. And we will 
have you, of course, join us again on Healthcare Experience Matters. We wish everyone the best. And thanks again, Kathleen. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Healthcare Experience Matters. Healthcare Experience Matters is brought to you by the Healthcare Experience Foundation. To learn more, please visit healthcareexperience.org. That's healthcareexperience.org.